Good morning. Are you awake? I, you know, each, I looked at the weather report this week. Each day just gets a little bit warmer. So looks like it's a little bit of a roller coaster, but the roller coaster just gets a little higher and higher. The temperature is going to get a little warmer and warmer. Uh, we saw a squirrel run across the road the other day, and we thought maybe that meant um, he's out of hibernation. I don't know. Maybe, maybe spring's just around the corner. Um, I, I will be honest with you, when I was younger, I really did love all that snow and that weather, but as an adult, I kind of love the summer a lot more, so um, you don't have to drive in it, you don't have to clear off your sidewalks, um, and, and you don't have to shiver when you're outside, that's kind of nice too. But hey, every season, uh, there's something really great to enjoy about every season, and we're glad that you're all here today, even though maybe it was a little chilly this morning, uh, but the sun's shining, and so are your bright and shining faces. We're glad to have you here today. Uh, we always like to take time here at the beginning if there's anybody who uh, is a guest and would like to introduce someone who brought with you, or um, if you would like to introduce yourself, now's not time to do that. I'm looking around and I don't see too many unfamiliar faces. So we're going to start with some announcements. If you have an announcement, come forward and you'll get a chance to say anything that, that you need to say. First thing I'm going to highlight today is that... Uh, for those of you that are watching online, the bulletin is on our church's website if you'd like to follow along. There's a link on a recent Facebook post. You can look at that. After worship today, those of you that are in the mentor and mentee program, um, there is a brief meeting following worship. Um, where is that meeting? In the youth room, thank you. In the youth room, there is a brief meeting after worship for anybody who's in the mentor or mentee program. Uh, we also have a 1030 Sunday school following church today and also membership classes will continue in Pastor Stan's office at 1030 as well. Tuesday, we have commission meetings coming up. Wednesday, believe it or not, is Ash Wednesday already. Uh, this coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. And then we also want to remind you Wednesday we have Awana and youth, but there will be no adult Bible study this coming Wednesday night. Um, you're encouraged also to look at your bulletin for additional announcements. Registration for summer camp is now open. Um, so start registering your kids for camp. Also, April 9 is um, Camp Mat Giving Day. And you can be part of helping Camp Mat reach the summit, which is a big inflatable raft in the, um, well, middle of the water <laughs> that the kids like to play on in the summer. Um, by uh, the summit of providing a sanctuary. Your time will maintain and approve many spaces around camp. Your donations will give campers the opportunity to achieve adventure on a new inflatable water slide called the summit. Volunteer projects are, they'll be digging out fire pits, cabin painting, washing life jackets, cookie prep, Installing decking, Quinter Miller roofing, trail, trimming, raking, mulching the challenge course. Their goal is 15,000, which would provide the new summit. So if, um, I'll post this on the bulletin board, but if you're not busy that day, come on out. Good morning. This morning, I'm going to introduce you to um, a resource that our church has purchased for all of its members to use. It's called Right Now Media, and it's like a Netflix with Christian content. So there's videos on there. There's resources for your personal use. There's resources that can be used for like Awana and Bible school, um, your Sunday school classes. Um, just for your family. There's stuff for all ages, all marital statuses. Um, so we're excited to have it. Um, and you will be getting an email um, allowing you to sign up and set a password. Um, and if you don't receive an email, um, then please contact Angie in the office. She's entered pretty much all the emails, I believe, from our directory and what we have in our records. So if for some reason you have a change in email or you don't receive the Right Now Media email, contact Angie, and we'll have a short video also describing what it is. Welcome to our study of the Gospel of John. I have fallen in love with the work of Paul as I've studied the book of 1 Corinthians, and I believe you will too. 
This is where Jesus taught in Capernaum. And you have to understand this scene. The Lord is my shepherd. And over the next six weeks, we're gonna look deeply into the 23rd Psalm. Right Now Media. It's for groups. It's for personal devotion. It's for parents. The bullseye of parenting is to raise children who become like Jesus. It's for kids. This is Phil. We're digging into the Bible, which, as we've mentioned, is more than just a book. It's for tough times. So when you recognize that you're trying to have a conversation with your spouse and they're not ready to talk, it's not helpful to keep pressing right. them. It's for every phase of life. If you've made mistakes with money, you know what that makes you? Over 12. And now, it's yours. We've purchased a Right Now Media subscription for everyone in our church. So check your inbox for the digital invitation and download the app for instant access to thousands of biblically-based videos. Get equipped. Get inspired. We're going to invite the... Acolytes to come forward as you and invite you to also to sing along with us with We Will Glorify. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords who is the great. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty, we will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness, we will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, he is Lord of all who Lord above the universe, all praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings, hallelujah to the Lamb, hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great. bow our heads and pray. Lord, we will glorify you today. That's, that's our plan. Uh, we also pray that if that plan changes, that it's led by the Holy Spirit. So we pray that the Spirit moves today throughout this service, that the songs that are sung, that the uh, message that is told, the children's story, uh, the, the scripture reading, everything involved, our prayer time, that you bless it. Uh, we know there's a lot of unrest happening in our country, not, not just in our country, but in the world. Uh, and we just, we give it all to you, Lord. We trust you, we have faith in you, and we ask that you protect us and continue to bless us and allow us to continue to worship freely as long as we live on this earth. In your name we pray, amen. Please stand and get excited because we're singing My Lighthouse. Uh, and don't be afraid to clap after My Lighthouse. Clap, clap. Don't be, don't be a, a shy of that one. So sing, sing out and sing loud. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions your truth will hold, your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea, whoa. You are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise 
you will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. What tomorrow brings With each moment I'll rise and sing My God's love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, You are the peace in my troubled sea You are my light My lighthouse My lighthouse Shining in the darkness I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. Safe to shore. Fire before us, you're the brightest, you will lead us through the storms. Fire before us, you're the brightest, you will lead us through the storms. Hey! Fire before us, you're the brightest, you will lead us through the storms. Fire before us. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. It's exciting to see you wake up. I saw a lot of dancing and motions. See the Awana people. Yeah, that's, that's a popular one they like to sing in Awana, and all the kids were going back and forth. Uh, the next song we're going to sing is Faithful God. Um, we just got done singing My Lighthouse, that the Lord is going to be our, our, what we focus on, our lighthouse, and give us that light. And we need to trust him and have faith in him. This one is Faithful God. I am surrounded on every side, can't see the light of day, but I am persuaded beyond all hope, you won't let go of me, I stake my claim on every word you say, you will not be late. I will sing through fire and thunder, cause you are on my side, I trust you with my life, I know my story isn't over, even against all odds, you are a faithful God, you're faithful God. darkest of weather though I can't see I still believe you're good so I'm moving forward through crashing waves I know I'm safe with you you hold my life you hear my cry with every breath inside I will sing through fire and thunder, cause you are on my side, I trust you in my life, I know my story isn't over, even against all odds, you are a faithful God, that 
Children, come on forward, and Jeanette has a children's story for you today. Now you can come on down. <laughs> Got you. difficulties. You have to clip it right for it to work. Okay, guys, I have some things to show you. I have to pull out the glasses. I'm getting old. <laughs> I know. I know. I now have to wear these. I have a pair everywhere, and I'm falling apart. Do you guys know what this is? A it's a map. Have you ever seen a map before? You have? Yeah? Well, I am old enough that when I first started driving, this is how we figured out where to go. So what I would do is, if I were going to a friend's house that I had never been there before, I would ask her, if I were driving far away, I'd ask her where she lived and what the nearest highway was and how to get from that highway. And then I would pull out the map and find that highway on the map and figure out how to get from my house to that highway. It's a lot of work. Do you know what would happen if I were driving and got lost? Could I drive like this? What would I have to do? I'd have to pull over and look at it, right? Yeah, it wasn't that fun. And then came MapQuest. Your parents probably used to use MapQuest. It would give you all the directions, but again, it was a piece of paper, and you'd have to hold it and be like, oh, where's my road? I don't know. Yeah, you guys have it so easy. Because now we have something on our phones called GPSs. Or my favorite is Siri. Siri can get me lots of places, but she cannot get me to Ligonier. <laughs> she always says, I don't know where Ligon is near. <laughs> I have to type in an address if I'm going to Ligonier, because she can't understand that. And you guys think I'm crazy. OK, so um, we have GPS now, right? And it makes it much easier. Um, although I do like to pull out a map once in a while on road trips if I'm not driving and see where I am because I'm kind of a nerd like that and I find it interesting. But we also have this. What is this? Oh, good. You got the good church answer. You know it is a Bible. You're exactly right. So if we want to know how to get home and we don't know where we are, I can ask Siri or my GPS on my phone how to get home. And usually I have to tell her my address because she doesn't know where home is. But do you know what? If we need to point someone to their heavenly home, we can go to the Bible. 
Do you guys know a verse in the Bible that might point someone to their heavenly home? Exactly. Can you guys want to say John 3.16 with me? Because I know you, most of you know it. Are you ready? John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Oh, you guys aren't doing so well. Come on. Can you help me? I know you know this. Can you help me? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And, you know, we can also point them into Romans. Romans will tell us more about how to be saved. If we don't know which way to turn, our GPS will tell us, right? They'll tell us even down to what side of the street we need to turn on, which was much better than a map or map quest. Guess what? In life, if you don't know where to turn, you can pray and read God's word. And the Bible will give us will guide us by giving us wisdom and helping us have peace on which decision or which way to turn. And just like um, GPS, have you ever heard the GPS say, slow down, there's a car stopped on the road ahead, or you're going to hit construction, it'll turn red, and you'll know, oh boy, we're going to hit construction. And maybe um, congestion where there's a lot of cars. In the same way, the Bible also warns us about, about danger. It tells us even what kind of friends we want to choose, and it tells us what sin is and what we should avoid, right? Yep. And if we want to go to a certain destination, we just plug our address into the GPS, right? Or ask Siri. Do you know the Bible has addresses too? Do you know that? It does. And you guys already told me one of the addresses. What was the address Jacob told me? What verse did Jacob say? And you guys all quoted to me. John 3.16. Yeah, and you were going to quote another verse because you've learned it at Awana, right, Bryce? Yeah. Well, you know, the Bible has two parts. What are the two parts of the Bible? One starts with an O and one starts with an N. Old Testament and New Testament. And once we know which part of the Bible that is in, it's then divided into books. And then the books have chapters, and then the verse ha- the big ch- big numbers, and the verse have verses. Those the verses have little numbers. Those are like an address. We can plug that in and find out exactly where to go. But you know what? Our GPS doesn't do any good unless we actually use it, right? It doesn't help us find directions unless we ask for it. Siri doesn't come on and say, I see you're lost. Where would you like to go? Right? We have to actually turn it on. And in order to use it, doesn't it have to be charged? Well, guess what, guys? We need to plug in our batteries each day so that we have energy and we know what we're doing. We have to ask God to help us understand what we're reading because there's a lot of verses in here that are kind of complicated and we don't quite get. They're not as quite easy to understand as John 3.16. So we can ask God to help us understand what we read. Okay? So, guys, when you are driving next with your mom or dad and they're asking Siri or plugging into an address on your phone, remember that that's much like our Bible. And let that serve as a reminder that we need to be reading it and praying every day. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for these kids. We thank you for all that they're learning about you through Sunday school, through Awana, through their parents, and the other things that they're doing. Father, we pray that they would just plug in every day um, to your charger and um, read your word and um, just understand it a little better each day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Jeanette, for that story. Again, that's as much for us as it is for them, for sure. Um, We're going to sing Behold Our God, and we invite you to stand and sing with us. Um, Just a reminder, there's a part in here where there's, it's sung eight times, where the guys say, you will reign forever, and the girls sing, let your glory fill the earth. Um, You'll see that the girls part is in the parentheses. It's in the middle of the song. So actually, it's a little bit towards the end, I guess. So please stand and sing Behold Our God. Ooh. Mm-hmm. 
has held the oceans in his hands, who has numbered every grain of sand. Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Who has given counsel to the Lord? Who can question any of his words? Who can teach the one who knows all things? Who can fathom all his wondrous deeds? Behold, I adore Him. Who has felt the nails upon His hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man? God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus Savior, risen now to reign. Behold our God, seated on his throne, come let us adore.
What a testament of hope. What a testament of worship. Tell you some of the things that's going on in our family of faith. We'll start out with the lighter things. Mr. Curtis Drake Sr. hit number 40 today. That one really bothered me. I hope it doesn't bother you as much as it bothered me. But now when I think 40, it's like, wow. <laughs> that was a long time ago. So happy birthday. Um, thanks again for the offerings. We'll have prayer for those as we go on in the prayer time. Uh, we want to pray for the Gray, uh, Wagner, and Kuhn families in their loss of Stephen Gray. Uh, he died last Sunday morning, and Stephen was Rosemary's nephew. Uh, Chuck, uh, his visitation, again, is going to be Tuesday from 4 to 8 at Yoder Kalp, and there will be an hour visitation here uh, at 1 o'clock right before the funeral service, which will be at 2 o'clock. And then... Uh, Dick told me about uh, Virginia Wysong, the, remember the Wysong family, they were very good friends with them, and she died, I think her funeral was yesterday. Uh, Dorothy is still in the hospital, and she has another UTI, <laughs> and now she has AFib. Now they gave her medicine for that, and that didn't go away, so she's, she's a little discouraged. So I, I tell you what, she's, I bet she'd take a call, I'm, I'm pretty sure, because she has her cell phone there. If you call her cell phone, you get a hold of her. They thought they might move her today. They weren't quite sure. Um, so we also think of brother-in-law Charlie. He'll have a PET scan on Monday, and we're praying that they find out it's the easier kind of, of cancer, if there is such a thing. Um, Mary is home from the hospital, um, feeling maybe a little bit better, but uh, she has a ways to go. And she requests prayers through Kermit that uh, doctors and they would make good decisions and she would not like any visitors at this time, and hopefully next week she'll start home health care therapy. I uh, want to tell you what's been going on in the Smeltzer's lives. Uh, JC and, and uh, others at Samaritan's Purse had their flights or scheduled to get out of Romania on Monday. She has been very close to all of this that's going on in Uganda. Uh, there's some unknowns yet, don't know if the flights are bringing her back to the U.S. or Germany, but Samaritan's Purse is still assessing the best way to help refugees pouring into Romania. Uh, they said they are expecting at least 500,000 refugees. Um, and then, you know, as, as um, they think about their daughter, then they think about uh, what about those in Ukraine? They're pastors and with their families that are refusing to leave. They said, we're here for the long haul. I had to think about that. You know, that's, that's government things that they're ready to stick it out for. What if, what if we were told we couldn't worship Christ anymore and, and they're going to come and uh, take us out if we do? You know, would we be as, as brave? That one guy said, I don't know how to use a gun. He said, I'll use a kitchen knife. You know, it's, it's really pretty amazing when you see this. And uh, according to reports this morning, it's not going the way Russia thought it would go. So... Keep praying for that situation. It makes you feel, and maybe sometimes we feel like a bully, but it just seems like a big bully picking on uh, someone, but um, who knows what it'll turn out. God knows. Um, so that is all on that, and I think it was a turnaround upside down morning. <laughs> uh, I think. Okay, which one did I miss? The, oh, yes. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the flowers... Um, are uh, there. They're beautiful, Natalie. Uh, they're in, in remembrance of Natalie's mother. Birthday. Okay, birthday. That's, that's cool. Let's come to God in prayer. Lord, you are an amazing God. And Lord, you give us music to worship you by, and I can't imagine how, how people can hear a tune like that and and have words like that and just put them together, and it's a song. And they're beautiful songs, Lord. Um, as we look at the words, what they say, and the sound to the ear is pleasing. So just uh, thank you, Lord, for giving us music. Thank you for giving us the different parts that we have of worship. Lord, we just ask you to be with the Gray Wagner Kuhn families, with the Hernley family, and with the Wysong family as they mourn the loss of, of loved ones. Um, 
We never know when we're going to lose our loved ones, uh, but when they're with you and in you and learn from you, we don't really lose them, so we're glad about that. Lord, uh, Dorothy, again, uh, she's pretty, pretty discouraged, and Mary, um, just be with them both. And we pray for Charlie, that you be with him as he goes through uh, his scan looking for cancer and taking a lymph node out, I believe. Uh, then we think about uh, new babies that are coming. Uh, we think about uh, Becky uh, and, and uh, Libby as they are waiting. It's, they have a little while to wait yet, but we're just glad for new life. And we think about the children we do have, and uh, when they get uh, so old, uh, they go out on their own, and, and we know that, and we try to prepare them for that, but Wow, uh, when we get in dangerous situations, that's, that is difficult to, to uh, think that, you know, is everything okay? Is everything okay? I mean, it just, I guess it trusts us to, to uh, trust or helps us to trust God more and more and more. And uh, Lord, we pray for that conflict in uh, Uganda. Um, we just give that to you. It's really, really something, and we'll just let you handle that, and we pray that, that um your will would be done. Well, it will. If not now, it will be later. Uh, so just be with that whole situation. And we think, you know, of other people who are in harm's way, of soldiers and missionaries. And um, we just ask that you would hear our unspoken request as we lift those up. God, we also pray for our church, the larger church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, but our uh, particular one here, our particular body of Christ, um, New Paris, and, and we pray for our district and different changes that are happening, and just, uh, you know, help us be wise about those things, too. And uh, we are grateful that we have the program that we have, the church program, and that we can learn about you and, and uh, just get closer to you, draw closer, learn some of the, the verses. The kids do very well in Awana and learning those. And then we pray for birthdays and for uh, a birthday that of one who's no longer with us. Just remember Marge and, and the pretty flowers there that remind us of her birthday. And um, the pregnancies, too, again, we lift them up. And Lord, we want to lift up the offering, understanding that, that you have enabled people to give and that people give and follow you, uh, your example. So we're, we're glad for that, Lord. There's no guarantee of that ever. Never want to take that advantage of that, but we just thank you for uh, what I see as a group of, of people who are very generous, and we're glad for that. So Lord, go with us now as we move into the message part of the service. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be reading from 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Please stand. Here is a trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, his desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. This message ties together with last week's and really ties together with the book of 1 Timothy we've been looking at. 
uh, 1 Timothy, especially last week, was looking at how to keep uh, order in worship. And apparently some of the ladies were uh, questioning their husbands, like, what, what is this teaching we're hearing? And uh, they said, well, to keep order, you need to ask that at home. Now, we know, too, that God had said uh, what he said about, you know, men won't teach women and that, and we know he said that for a reason. Now, we can't always figure out reasons, but we can look and see of a couple ways the way it might have been, and we'll do that today also. So, we don't really have elders too much anymore in the Church of the Brethren. And I didn't, I was looking at the one that said elder. Most of them said overseer. Now, an overseer would be someone, what it sounds like, that oversees everything else that's going on. Uh, the elder was pretty much, if we're looking at the early church, was pretty much the leader of that church. Probably was a pastor, but not necessarily. Um, the elders, the churches that still have them, help the pastor out in making decisions. People have asked me for a decision already, and I can't give it. They said, well, you're the pastor. You have to do what you say. I said, oh, no. Oh, no, that's not the way it works here. Um, you know, and, and through most of the church, your brothers were congregation-oriented. What the congregation wants is what goes, not necessarily what the pastor wants. So this would be a very important person. And in my thinking, I wish we still had them because... It's, you know, and we had them because we didn't have paid pastors, all right? So the elder, the overseer kind of took the place of the paid pastor. And uh, as, as we look at, at what they did then, they would call deacons, which we're going to look at next week, and uh, they would get together. I know a church now, a church of the brethren that has this set up, the elders, well, the pastors and the deacons are called the official board. Nothing comes to council meeting without being approved by official church board. And that's how this would have been, this church here, at one time. So we've gone through uh, different, different places and, and different uh, scenarios. But lots of times, you know, we, we look at what we're doing and, and what we're getting done. And, and we wonder if we are using the best way that there is. With the elders, um, they would say what they thought should happen. And I think their vote was equal by it with the pastor. Uh, but it came because the pastors needed, no, you know, at Cadoris, they called two pastors. They said, okay, uh, this person and this person, maybe three, have been called to be preachers. And some of you know that's how you were called to be a preacher or a deacon, usually called out from the congregation itself. Uh, and all of a sudden, people wouldn't take what God had called them to do. They said, we're not going to do it. And uh, that ultimately is uh, brought in the pastor. And I don't know, maybe some of the pastors didn't like having to answer to an elder board. But I think it, with this, I'm going to answer this question pretty quickly. I think we threw the baby out with the bathwater. And that means, you know, we had something good going. And certainly bathwater is dirty. You want to get rid of that. But we, we kind of threw out what was good, too. And again, that wasn't this church's fault. That was the overall church decided to do that way. All right, so let's look at what the uh, thing, the qualifications were for elder. We can certainly look at them and wonder, you know, if we had elders today, who would they be? So we'll start with a prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you for your love and who you are. I just ask you, Lord, to be with me and, and help me know uh, where I'm at and what I'm wanting to say and help clear my head and, and that uh, your thoughts would be my thoughts and we just give you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name, amen. So as we unpack this, verse 1, the trustworthy saying, now what's a trustworthy saying? Something you can trust, something you can count on. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Okay, so it's nothing really wrong with that task. Now, the odd part is lots of times now the churches go with a call. Um, I was telling somebody, I'm reading Romans, I mean, uh, Psalms 8 as my uh, scripture, my visiting scripture when I go to see somebody. Uh, all of them hear the same thing in the, in the same month. So, you know, Psalm 8, I remember 
um, I had to memorize it, and I was pretty scared. And, but I did it, and I, Mom had me dressed up in a suit and a tie. And afterwards, everyone came up and said, you look just like a little preacher. Yeah, you look, that's what you look like. You're going to be a little preacher. You're going to be a preacher someday. And, and I said, no, I don't think so. But, you know, that's, that's kind of that people see some of these things in you and come to you. And then it's up to the person who is asked to say, okay, now where did this come from? If it came from God, I better seriously look at this before we just say no and, and give up. Okay, so we go on now. We're going to look at 15 qualifications to be an elder over an overseer. Uh, we see some of that in verse 2. Uh, the overseer must be above reproach. We'll talk about what these things are. The husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach a good reputation among believers. And you think, man, oh man, why, why do you worry about what your, your leader decides or what he looks like or what he cares, how he motivates or, or uh, runs. Well, you do because he sets the example. He sets the tone of, of what other people are going to do. You know, if we have board meeting and if I'm there early and everybody comes in, I tell a different joke. You know, sometimes it can be hard to, to get everybody back to thinking on the same page. Uh, so, but if I'm in there and, and prayerfully waiting for the meeting to give or to begin, people notice that too. And, and so they're going to follow their leader, whether you, you think that or not. So how should the leader look? The overseer should be above reproach. Okay, what's that mean? Well, that means that every, anything you can throw at him is not going to stick. Okay? Now, sometimes you get, you know, Jesus, they tried to get two people to agree on what he did wrong, and they couldn't do it because you had to have two witnesses, but it was just one. So no matter, you know, if as, as your leader, spiritual leader, I would pray that if somebody said something that sounds really out of character for me, that you would say, that, oh, that can't be right. Um, <laughs> this is a long time ago. I don't have the people's permission to tell a story. So, But somebody... Uh, Nancy and I had the opportunity to uh, go and use somebody's uh, lodge, not lodge, but um, a rental down at the ocean. And we really had a nice time. We came back, and some lady said that uh, someone else paid that trip for us, and, you know, they gave them the money. Well, actually, the lady said, I think my husband gave you that money instead of using it in our family. And... Uh, so I hope, and I, I think in that case, that person said, oh, no, 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 and uh, talked to someone else that knew that person a little better and, and got that straightened out. Now, I'm sure I've made mistakes, but hopefully I would never do something like that. Uh, so, so that's above reproach. You would just say, I, I don't believe that. That, that person didn't do that. Um, and and uh, the building blocks of being blameless come. And it talks about a married man with one wife. Now, I just want to show you that we don't always know what God means when he writes these things or has them written. Uh, so we, we look at them. Um, I wanted to look up like when they're translating a the Bible, it could be a dozen people or so working at it, uh, looking at the Greek and saying what they think. And they try to come up with the best possible scenario. So in this case, they came up with four possibilities. One was that a man would be married and his wife would die because it said it should be a married man with one wife. So that disqualifies um, men whose wives die, but it doesn't. Um, you know, Jesus said the widows should get involved in the church things, and I'm sure he would have said the same thing about the widowers. Uh, so an another one say, well, how about after a divorce. Well, people like that one the best of the translators, and so we've heard that a lot of times, that after a divorce, that disqualifies uh, a person for, for deaconship. Uh, so then, that was the most, but a couple of them said, well, we believe that Jesus gave an escape clause, and that sounds like something I'm trying to trick you, but it's two places where I think Jesus says one and Paul says the other, uh, and they talk about 
um, that if the person is in unfaithful to you, if your wife is unfaithful to you, if the man is unfaithful to his wife, that's grounds for divorce. So that's the two that they've hung with mostly. Um, and it just makes me wonder the way divorce was part of their culture, if that wasn't more the right one. Um, I got to tell you, I don't know for sure. Uh, so we certainly try to act in grace. I think what, what God is saying is he's looking for a one woman man. Okay. Oh, the other one was, uh, that meant they had two wives, but that happened early in Israel's history, but it didn't happen later. So we don't think that's it. Uh, so that, you know, if, and I've told you before, if, if you've had a divorce and stuff, just stay where you are now. Um, you know, I think that's the best thing. I, uh, think that you just let God know that, hey, you know, you know what's going on. I love you. I want to be yours. And I see no place where that says that's unforgivable. All right. Okay. Uh, temperate. What's that mean? Well, that's moderation in all things. Okay. Now, lots of times we use it on alcohol, but really things like I was a workaholic. I just worked and worked and worked and and then, I, I don't know if why I didn't want to go home, but I just didn't. Um, and so then we have to stay within limits. We don't want to be extreme or excessive. Um, you know, when you hear something, instead of blowing off right away, you got to think about it and just, just, just take this calmly and, and see. Respectable, that refers to the social graces. And to be respected, we would be polite and also hospitality. Uh, hospitality we've kind of lost. Uh, don't fear asking somebody into your house. Um, you know, if you say, but it's dirty, well, put up a sign that says it was clean yesterday. Sorry, you missed it. And, and you don't have to give anybody fancy food. It can be soup, something else, uh, I don't know, crackers and cheese or whatever. The, the fellowship's an important part rather than what you have and, and what you uh, serve. Okay, so there is, um, the next one is rather a distinct character, and it comes the closest to being a job description. It says that you're supposed to be able to teach. Now, how many people, when we ask them to, uh, to teach, they say, oh, no, I can't do that. No, 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 I can't do it. I want to say, I imagine all of you can teach. How about if you're working at your job and someone comes in, the boss says, hey, they're going to be doing about what you're doing. Can you show them how? What is that? Teaching. Teaching. Uh, so, so we can do that more than we think. And if we learn the Bible, we can teach the Bible. Um, I see there's a men's Bible study group that goes on in this church online. And I'm a part of it that I can see what they're saying. And I can tell you they're being challenged, and, and you know, what some of the stuff they say they could teach, and I think certainly teaching is in some of their future, and some have already, okay? So, number one tells us that the important task for any church leader is teach the Holy Spirit Scriptures and deal with those false teachers who mishandle them. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go out and fight the false teachers yourself, but be, be aware. Again, if, if you had church elders, you could go to the elders and say, hey, here's what happened. Uh, one church in town uh, is, is um, King James only, okay? So they're telling their congregation, if there's any church in New Paris that's not using King James, they're going to hell. You know, now that's something that you could go to your church leaders about and say, hey, maybe we ought to talk to them and, and uh, see if they, how they can explain that. But um, So, you know, you can teach. You can teach. You might not be able to stand up in front of people. You can teach one-on-one. -on -one. I've seen many of you do it. How did you make that uh, beautiful dessert? And you give them a handwritten or whatever, a nice recipe, and, and tell them it's not that hard. You can do this and do that. Uh, that... You know, and as you learn the Bible, you can teach the Bible. You can teach right where you're at if uh, the Lord so moves you. Okay. Um, we, it's a, uh, the leader is, is a serious business, so you don't necessarily choose a popular person. Okay. 
you, if you want a, a church leader, you look at their life and you see what's going on. You just don't want to, hey, they're popular, so we'll put them there. Or uh, how about the ones that, uh, you know, and they push their way to the top when they get in something. No, you don't want that either. Um, you know, verse 2 says, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will be qualified to teach others. All right? Again, this is not about us people. It's not about, well, I can't do it. I can't. What, did, what did Moses say? I can't do this. I can't do that. And God said, it's not you. It's my words. And then he finally had a promise to send Aaron, and then Moses would do it. But we shouldn't have to do that as well. So when we think about popularity and all that, it's more important than thinking how many students you may be brought to Christ or how many students came to Christ under your teaching. That's not as important as what did you teach that one person that God sent you? What do you think about Billy Graham and who taught him about the Bible? Do you think he could have ever imagined what, how that would multiply and how that would grow? I don't think so. And the multiplication, that, that's the way to do it. You tell two people, those two people tell two. Uh, it, it starts slow. You think, man, this is never getting anywhere. And boy, after a while, it really goes. So be studying the scriptures and, and ready to do them. Now, I don't know, did many of you go to the school of hard knocks? I kind of... <laughs> think I went to the school of hard knocks. But, you know, you can learn through living. And some people learn more through life experience than being in the classroom. Nothing wrong with the classroom setting at all. Uh, I learn better when it's hands-on. And I mean really hands-on, like someone puts their hand there and says, put your hand on top of mine, because you know I'm a master of disaster. So <laughs> as, we, as we look at that, you know, just, just remember that uh, someone, you might inspire somebody to live for Christ in your work just by something you say. Um, just that, something that I don't normally do, I should, but uh, there was a, an Amish lady on the uh, elevator with me yesterday at the hospital, and she said, are you going down? And I said, yeah, and then I thought, but someday I'm going up. She said, yes, that's right, me too. You know, and that just gives you the opportunity to, to share. It just, you'll, you'll be surprised how you feel if you get brave enough to do that. And sometimes that opens a whole conversation that you weren't looking for or weren't really ready for. Okay, so the church leader, the elder, is uh, the body of Christ leader, the local ones. And, uh, you know, four traits that he should not have all right, is found in verse 3. Shouldn't be given to drunkenness. Okay, now, I imagine a lot in here have already been drunk. That does not disqualify you from God. But it shouldn't be the state of your life. Um, the one church had a, a deacon. It was a good deacon, but every Saturday night he'd spend down at the bar, and he was a mocking, uh, you know, they just mocked him and mocked him and his church. He did a lot of damage to that because of that. So you're not given to much drunkenness, not violent. This is the only one that gives you the opposite. You should be gentle. Guys, gentleness doesn't come easy. We have to learn gentleness. That's why we look so awkward when we hold our children, because we're afraid we're going to crush them to death. So work on that being gentle. Not quarrelsome. Wife, do you hear that? It's your fault. No, it's your fault. <laughs> We get going sometimes on that. Uh, just the other day, she said something. I said, hey, there's a competition again. So we don't want to be quarrelsome. Uh, we don't want to be a lover of money. Does that mean I have to give all my money away? No. Lover of money. That means you put money in front of everything else. And the rich young ruler showed us that because he put that in front of serving Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, verse 4. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. All right. 
it is interesting how the church hinges with the home. Um, that we can see how a home is managed and see how the church will be managed. Number two, and we talked about this when I said about the deacon's wife dying, it is not absolutely required that an elder be married and have children. You know, it's said about his wife, but it really doesn't say anything about children. But if there's a wife, there's probably going to be children. If he is and does, however, he must have a well-managed family. Well-managed family. So when you see our grandkids running around, you say, well, that, that wasn't my call. <laughs> no, I talked to them. Say, hey, you don't need to be running. Uh, but have you seen some of the, the pastor families already? Um, we had some pastors with kids, and those kids were something else. And uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe the pastoring took up too much of their time, and the kids didn't get enough time. All right, now... The word is manage. How do we manage? It's not rule. It's not a cruel dictatorship. Uh, number three, a believer's household needs love, discipline, mercy, and guidelines. If parents don't model what they teach, their children will rarely follow unless made to. You're going to church if I have to drag you the whole way there. That's uh, not managing your family. Then you grab a hold of their hair or something and start pulling. That, that's not good. That's not good. Respectful children is a sign that the parents are doing their job correctly. And as they manage their family, they start earning their family's trust and respect. But that's a full-time job. We can't even take a lunch break from that because, you know, we can ruin our witness, our whole day's witness by something we do at break. So it does take a lot, and it is a big deal. Uh, number four, his ability, again, the overseer, his ability to handle the family forms a training ground for a man's ability to guide the family of God in a local congregation. Again, one of the things I'm pleased about is we don't have a lot of church widows that come on Sunday. Most of your husbands come, and, and that's great, because if your husbands won't come, that it's only a matter of time till the kids start saying, well, why must we come? Doesn't, not, not always that way, but it certainly has uh, the possibility of happening. Okay, uh, it takes the same love, compassion, firmness, and mercy are needed for uh, the house or the home and also the church. All right, verse 6. He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. Think, well, how in the world might that happen? Well, there's been some sports stars and, and people who have had interesting testimonies that go out to give that testimony before they're mature enough. Okay? Uh, if you give your testimony to a larger crowd, like, you know, we'll never face crowds like that. But maybe you go to a, a larger church and you give your testimony. And like I said, everyone told me I was going to be a little preacher. People come up to you and say, that's wonderful. That, we didn't even need a message today. That was just great. You know, after a while, if you hear that enough, you can start believing it. And so that's why you need to be more mature. And that's why we keep pushing what we're being told we're doing good, try to keep pushing that to God. Keep pushing that to Jesus. Without them, I'm nothing. Uh, something that came to me during the message is them. They are the ones you go to. Number five, too often a church desperate for workers places new believers in positions and of responsibility too soon. Okay? 
Again, it says they can become conceited when that happens. Hey, you know, look, look what position they gave me. And, and conceit literally means wrapped in smoke. Are you from more familiar with that? Oh, he's just blowing smoke. You know, someone, that's probably what people were saying about Putin. He's just blowing smoke when they're trying to decide would he charge or would he not. A person can be so inflated with pride they cannot even get a true picture of what they look like. I thought about bringing a balloon and blowing it up and then let it go. You know how it sounds like a stinker? <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, that's how we can be when we get puffed up. Uh, so, then number five tells us that uh, too often a church desperate... And I said that already, I'm sorry. Uh, so, a person... The pride means uh, more than self-esteem. Certainly, we have self-esteem when, when you do a good job, when your kids do a job. Uh, you have satisfaction when a job's well done. But never put yourself in a place where you're comparing and uh, looking at church office and this and that to be superior than a friend, to be superior than someone else. And, and the church can help us do that if, you know, as a church, wait a little bit. Uh, someone comes and we're so desperate for workers, we just grab them and say, you can do it. And they might be able to, but it'd be better for them and better for the church if we wait just a bit. You know, it might only have to be a month, two months, and depends how the person grows. Okay, uh, we're told about the judgment of Satan, uh, that you know, and Satan, how he gets people under his control is with traps. You know, the trap he lied and said, is it true you can't eat from any tree? And, and all those things that he said. Uh, you know, he told uh, Jesus when Jesus was being tempted, hey, I can do this for you, I can do that. So he has been tricked and, and tripped up, but he also follows uh, with a trap, trying to catch us. And, and the ones who follow his example and the ones who fall for his uh, traps and don't even try to get out can certainly send us to the wrong destination. Not a destination we want for eternity, for sure. The lake of fire. So pride and conceit are part of the devil's downfall. If you do a good job on something, if you're doing pretty good, he'll, he'll put somebody in your life to tell you how good you are. And, and uh, you know, and, and it goes further than that sometimes. Um, as we look at people who uh, perhaps call somebody and, you know, try to, they, they learn to know somebody. That somebody did something really good. And, and this person says, boy, that's so, that's so neat. I want to interview you. So they interview him. And then they say, well, now I'm going back up to my room. Uh, do you want to come along? Okay, what's, what is that? But a trap, a trap. And, and you need to see that even before you get that far. Uh, and hopefully we can with God's help. We covet. Brothers and sisters, we covet. If we only had a gym, everything would be okay. If we only had a live band for worship, everything would just be fine. If we only started worship earlier, that would be great. If we only started worship later, that would be great. You know, it's kind of like a, a guy was telling somebody that he has a, a, a train, he has an engine and maybe another car, and he's supposed to move these cars. And, and his engine is kind of old, and he thinks, you know, if only I had one or two or maybe even five new engines, boy, could I go down the road then? Would that be something? And the guy listening to him says, how about this? How about you light the fire in the engine you have and get steaming down the track? You hear what I'm saying? We, we, we think so much about what we don't have that we neglect what we do. I think I'm guilty of that sometimes, especially when the depression comes. I'm, I'm guilty, I have to say. We want our leaders to have a good reputation. 
with people outside the church because that's the non-believers and that's the community and that's uh, the church leaders can give the body of Christ a good reputation and good advertising or it can be the opposite. When somebody says, I saw the preacher of such and such a church at the bank and they wouldn't even look at me. They wouldn't even give me a glance. Or the new pastor of this church, I met him. He's really something. He's great. What a difference that can make. Number six, to the secular world church leaders, I'm sorry, yeah, to the secular world church leaders are the most visible people of the church. Okay, they're going to know you quicker than they know the, the actual leader. Leaders maintain the highest of standards and the best reputation. That's what we want, but what do we get? Church leaders who make the headlines for money missing from offerings. Church leaders who have taken money that was supposed to be given to missions and used it for a bonus for himself. We have all these sexual escapades, and we have a youth pastor that has, you know, abused a young lady. Those kind of things kill our ministry. We can have a hundred things good, and if we get involved in one of those things, it just kills it. The message of the gospel never changes, but a good reputation does wonders to bring curious non-believers into the church. When they see you and they know you're living differently, they know that you're happy, maybe not happy, you're, you've decided to be joyful, when they see the God working, it doesn't mean we don't have to talk to them. We still do, but they're going to know something's different. And they will check it out. And some may say, I'd like to know this Jesus too. When believers are dependable friends and dependable neighbors, that good reputation the Lord wants is out there. So remember, how we carry out our duties as citizens, neighbors, and friends helps or frustrates our ability to communicate the gospel. A couple questions to end it up. Do you have friends who are not believers? i got to believe we all have some of those. Next one, does your conduct help or hinder the cause of Christ? And number seven, as the church carries out her mission in an increasingly secular world, she needs to build bridges with unbelievers in order to bring them to Christ. We don't have an elder. We don't have an overseer. So a lot of that goes down to a pastor. Not that complaining, that's just how it goes. I think pastors need the help of everybody to make the church look attractive. Is that the right word? Inviting? That they can come in here and find out the way to live a new life. That no matter what is going on in their lives, it can be helped. It can be made better. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this section of Scripture. And, and uh, again, I think maybe we threw the ba uh, baby out with the bathwater, but are we going to moan and lament, or are we going to put some smoke in our own engine and build a fire and, and get moving? Lord, the position of pastor was not created to take care of all the spiritual things of a church. It is uh, uh, something we do together that we help one another with. And we love you that you use us, but we challenge you to push us. Push, push, push. 
And Lord, if, if someone has not made a decision for you, I hope you push them to come to see me or come up the aisle or, or whatever and talk to them about what is available out there for the believer and how the believers are supposed to live. Don't go home today without having known Jesus. Don't forget that if you confess with your heart that Jesus is Lord and believe in your mind or heart that God, the Lord raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. Stand if you're able and turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes to the hillside where justice and mercy embrace. There the Son of God gave his life for us, and our measureless debt was erased. Jesus to you we lift our eyes, Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes to the morning and see Christ the lion awake. What a glorious dawn, fear of death is gone, for we carry his life in our veins. Jesus to you we lift our eyes, Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes to the heavens, our kingdom return for its home. Every knee will bow, every tongue will shout, all glory to Jesus alone. To you we lift our eyes, Jesus, our glory and our pride. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. 
Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our pride. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Upon Jesus and all God's people said, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth. 